Again, we have a spherical distribution of charge. And we'll draw in a radial axis. As in our last video lesson, we'll say that this plastic sphere carries a total charge of capital Q. The sphere has a radius of capital R. And we want to figure out what's the electric potential at the center, point A. What's the electric potential at the surface, point B. What's the electric potential at just any random point outside of the sphere? And lastly, what's the electric potential at point D infinitely far away? So we're going to apply this familiar expression. The electric potential at point 2 minus electric potential at point 1 is negative the integral along a path from 1 to 2 of E dot... Well, we, we generally say E dot ds, but in a spherical distribution, our path is going to be along a radial axis. Okay. Well, let's see. We can use Gauss's law to find the electric field inside, and we can use Gauss's law to find the electric field outside. Now, we know how it's going to come out for points outside. Whether the sphere is plastic or metal, regardless of what the radius of the sphere is, at points outside, it acts as if all the sphere is concentrated at the center, and at any point outside, electric field is just kq over r squared. Now, for points inside, we're going to assume, unless told otherwise, that the volume charge density is uniform or constant. Uh, maybe in our next video lesson we'll go over a case where we have non-uniform distribution of charge throughout this plastic sphere. But like I say, unless told otherwise, we're always going to assume uniform charge density. So if I want to find what's the electric field at some point inside, let's say at that x, and I make a Gaussian surface, and we're going to avoid doing any brute force method for deriving an expression. Gauss's law makes this pretty simple. The integral of e dot dA is equal to q in over epsilon naught. Um, step one, step two, step three. There's a few things about the symmetry here that uh, if you don't remember, I'll encourage you to rewatch some videos. But it's a few steps to ultimately say this just really boils down to electric field times the area of the Gaussian surface. So E times 4 pi lowercase r squared is equal to Q in over epsilon naught. Now, when we take Q in divided by the volume of the Gaussian surface, that gives us the exact same expression as the total charge Q divided by the total volume. In other words, Q in is equal to total Q times the volume of the Gaussian surface, 4 thirds pi lowercase r cubed, divided by the, vol the total volume, 4 thirds pi capital R cubed. Of course, the four-thirds and the pi cancel out. So in place of Q in, I just replace this with capital Q times the ratio lowercase r cubed over capital R cubed. And don't forget the epsilon naught. So the electric field inside is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, 4 pi epsilon naught, times Q, and then let's see, that R squared cancels with two of these R's, so we're left with R over R cubed. Or, how about we just make this one concise expression, E equals K Q R over capital R cubed. Now, capital R is a constant, so the only variable here is lowercase r. So this means if we were to graph electric field versus radius, then from the center up to the surface, we have an electric field that's directly proportional to r to the first. It grows linearly, and then at points outside, drops off as 1 over r squared. Now, this is different than the metal sphere. If the sphere is metal, and we graph electric field, then from the center to the surface, the electric field is just all zero. And then from there on, drops off as 1 over r squared. Okay. 
is going to save us a little bit of time just recognizing the comparison of these graphs for an insulator or plastic versus metal or a conductor. Bear with me as I clean this up. Okay, so now we know what E in is equal to K Q lowercase r over capital R cubed. And we're going to need that as our expression for E if our path takes us from point A to point B. Now we know we can just set the electric potential infinitely far away equal to zero. So we've got the electric potential at point D just by making a choice. The electric potential at point C, well, no surprise because E out is the same whether this sphere is plastic or metal. Uh, we can go through the same steps we did in the last video lesson and show that the electric potential at point C is just going to be K Q over R. In fact, we can also use that to show that the electric potential at point B is K Q over capital R. The difference is going to be the electric potential at the center. If this sphere was metal instead of plastic, then we know the electric potential at A has to equal the electric potential at B. If there was any difference in those two values, uh, then that difference in potential would drive an electric current through the conductor. Because this is plastic, it's not necessarily true that the potentials have to be equal. Even if there's a difference in potential from the center to the surface, it's not going to drive an electric current because plastic is an insulator. And so it can't respond to the difference in electric potential. Okay, so how do we figure this out? Well, we say the electric potential at point A minus the electric potential at point B has to be equal to negative the integral, a path that takes us from B to A of E dot dr. Now this E, is that E in or is it E out? Well, yeah, clearly since we're going from B to A, we're only encountering the electric field inside. So the electric potential at point A minus KQ over capital R, that is indeed the electric potential at the surface, is equal to positive the integral from A to B, or in other words, from 0 to capital R, of K Q R over R cubed dr. So the electric potential at point A is equal to K Q over R plus K Q over R cubed times the integral from 0 to R of R dr. Is that right? So I just added this to both sides of the equation to account for that part of the expression. This just comes from pulling all the constants out of the integral. So we know the solution to this is 1 half capital R squared. So we get the electric potential at point A is kq over r plus one half kq over capital R. We see that this r squared cancels with two powers of r and then the one half. Okay, so it's equal to three halves kq over r. In other words, the electric potential at point A is a hundred and fifty percent of the electric potential at the surface. Now what if we were to change our reference? What if we just chose arbitrarily 
to say instead of v equals 0 at r equals infinity, let's say v equals 0 at the center. Then what's the electric potential at point b? What's the electric potential at point c? And what's the electric potential infinitely far away? Well, I'm going to leave that up to you as a challenge to determine. Just know that the difference in electric potential from A to B is the same whether I'm using the reference frame in case 2 or I'm using the reference frame given in case 1. The difference in electric potential between any two points, VB minus VC, has to be the same whether I'm basing it off of this reference frame or this reference frame. Knowing that, see if you can determine what's the electric potential at the surface, what's the electric potential at point C, and what's the electric potential infinitely far away. All right.